The pancreas is an endocrine gland, but it contains endocrine and exocrine tissue. So if we think about the pancreas, it's, uh, it's got a long pancreatic duct inside with many branches. And the pancreas is described as an organ with a head, a body and a tail. So this would be the head towards the right. And this tube actually goes out and joins up with the uh, curve of the duodenum. Via a sphincter here that's called the sphincter of, or used to be called the sphincter of Oddi. Now the vast bulk of the tissue of the pancreas is exocrine in nature. It's producing the enzymes that go down into the duodenum, the lipase, the amylase, the various protolytic enzymes. But throughout the pancreas, there's about a million little islets of tissue throughout the pancreas. It is the, the minority of the pancreatic tissue, but there are many pancreatic islets. And you might remember these are the classic old fashioned name, they're the pancreatic islets. And the name that's associated with them is Langerhan. After the guy who first saw them down a microscope. Now, if you look at the pancreatic islets in more detail, they're not that big. They're made out of um, rings of tissue. Well, islets of tissue, not rings, they're different shapes. And on the outside, there's um, one type of cell. Now, when you look at it in the microscope, you can't really tell the difference, but histologically, this is the case. Towards the outside, it's more likely you're going to find cells called alpha cells. That's the Greek letter alpha. So they're the alpha cells towards the outside. And towards the core of the islet, you're more likely to find beta cells. That's Greek letter beta. So two different types of endocrine tissue in the pancreas. And as you would expect, the endocrine tissue is very vascular. So an arteriole will approach, divide into numerous capillaries, and uh, leave again. So an arterial supply and a venous drainage, but giving plenty of opportunity for the formed endocrine products to get into the bloodstream. To be directly transported away into the systemic circulation. And the same with the products of the alpha cells. And the alpha cells, you probably know, produce glucagon. They produce glucagon. And the beta cells famously produce insulin. Now, what happens here is when the blood sugar levels rise, that's detected by the beta cells. So the beta cells are hyperglycemia detectors. So the beta cells detect rises in blood sugar levels. When the rise in blood sugar level is detected, they produce insulin. And insulin is the endocrine hormone that will lower blood sugar levels. Insulin is going to convert glucose to glycogen for storage in the liver and muscles. And the insulin is going to increase the amount of glucose that is transported across the cell membranes where it can be used by the mitochondria. So insulin is required to get the glucose into the cells. 
Now, conversely, the alpha cells, they'll start working <coughs> when there's a hypoglycemia, or relatively. So when the blood sugar levels start to fall, then the glucagon will be released. So these cells are both the detectors, the alpha and beta cells are both detectors and they are the effector cells, they're the ones that release the hormone. So remember the beta cells are activated by high blood sugar levels and produce insulin to lower blood sugar levels. The alpha cells are stimulated by low blood sugar levels and they release glucagon to increase blood sugar levels. So the glucagon will convert the stored glycogen back into glucose. That process is called gluconeolysis. So the stored glycogen will be converted back into glucose. And the difference here is the glycogen is in the muscles and it's in the liver, but it's insoluble, whereas the glucose is soluble, so it goes into the blood and raises blood sugar levels. And that'll last you for a couple of days if you don't eat. But of course, humans are survival mechanisms. We are designed to survive. So if you run out of stored glycogen, that's not too bad. We can go on for a little bit yet because there's another process called gluconeogenesis. And again, this process is stimulated by glucagon. And this process will take things like lactate and glycerol. And there's a couple of fatty acids. So it will convert fatty type molecules and protein molecules also into glucose. And that means you are raising blood glucose levels. Because we need a certain amount of glucose in the blood, of course, otherwise the brain's going to stop working. So the glucagon in the short term will raise blood sugar levels by gluconeolysis, in the longer term by gluconeogenesis. And there is another process that uh, glucagon can stimulate, that's called uh, ketogenesis, where the liver cells, mostly the liver cells, are stimulated by glucagon to produce ketones which is the body's emergency fuel supply. So the pancreas is endocrine with its alpha and beta, but it's also exocrine because it's producing useful digestive enzymes. You might remember the bile ducts join up here as well and this area is called the ampulla and the whole lot goes into the duodenum to emulsify fats and carry out the digestive processes. Now quite why, what is the, quite what the advantage is of having the pancreatic islets, this endocrine tissue, this vital endocrine tissue uh, in the pancreas, I'm not too sure about. You know, you might think that um, it would be the liver, for example, that would produce the uh, glucagon and the insulin. But it's not, this is the way it is, it's in the pancreas. I'm sure there's a good reason for it. And of course, you know that in type one diabetes, the immune system will eradicate, tragically, eradicate the uh, beta cells. And if the beta cells are eradicated by the immune system, there's a complete deficiency of insulin causing type one diabetes mellitus. So the basic endocrine functions of the pancreas.